Hey everyone, welcome to the Ganja Show. Our guest for the day is Thomas and Nikita. Both of them, uh, we met I think four months back, and finally we are able to make some time for the podcast. Uh, both are co-founders of uh, Lumino, earlier known as Bloom Jobs. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for coming on the show. How are you doing? Thanks for having us, Vipin. Very, very well. Thank you. Yeah, really, really good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, doing very well. Thank you. But, yeah. But yeah, big, big fan of the show. Just gonna. Get- <laughs> On the get go, I was going to say, I think what you're doing is brilliant. And it's so exciting to see, like, from, from my perspective, it's one of the first things I've seen from the region. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm excited to learn more. And I think there's a huge amount of pent up interest in that region as well. So hopefully we can tap into some of that. 100%. I mean, India is uh, known as one of the home grounds for actual cannabis, like in terms of ancient history. So uh, people are saying it's the time for India, but... <laughs> I don't see anything from the government as of now, but still, like I myself, I'm moving to a different country, so uh, I'm not the best example anymore. But one one interesting thing I heard about uh, Amsterdam, I think now they're limiting the coffee shops to locals. Is that uh, true? Um, so that that's been a topic of conversation for multiple years now. Um, the mayor of Amsterdam seems to be quite in favor of it and is trying to push her agenda. Um, how that plays out in regulation actually changing is mm-hmm. usually very different so i'm sure the media is jumping on it but it isn't a big topic of conversation here in amsterdam as this is not the first time that this has happened i yeah. don't i think uh, there's quite some work that has to be done for this to actually be implemented um and then you there's also other incentives like the um cannabis exp- or the uh, recreational experiment that is going on here in which 10 companies have been selected uh, to cultivate for a selected pool of 74 coffee shops in the Netherlands. Yeah. And the, you know, the game here is to close the back door, as it's called here in the Netherlands, which is that coffee shops are allowed to sell cannabis, but where does this cannabis come from? They're not allowed to cultivate it. So now they want to give out 10 licenses for people to cultivate legal cannabis for these coffee shops. So with these kinds of incentives, I think it's a step in the right direction to actually regulate this market and not shut it down for a certain portion of people coming in. So it seems it seems like, yeah, it's more of the agenda of the of the mayor than it is of the country. Um, um, and it's not the biggest topic of conversation here at all. I, I personally don't think that much is going to happen from it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I it's so. probably media because I, as I mean, college students before, I think four or five years back, everyone used to like, keep their destination as Amsterdam if they wanted to experience yeah. cannabis like before Canada also so it was quite shocking to hear that I mean what do you think Thomas I mean about this I remember speaking to so for reference the teacher and I have known each other since we we're 11 from back at school and I remember yeah. at school hearing about Amsterdam doing exactly this and it seems like every few years it comes up in the media that like the Amsterdam mayor is going to step up and close the coffee shops and then there's a big uproar and lots of attention to the coffee shops and then probably more people going and then nothing <laughs> seems to happen. So if anything, yeah. it's a really effective marketing strategy to get yeah. more people to the coffee shops and it's like, oh, we need to go. It's like a sense of urgency sell. Uh, so I don't know if that's the plan, but it seems to be working in that way. So if they're genuinely trying to stop it, then they're being counterintuitive in, in my opinion. Also, the, the um, biggest... Sorry, Tom, just kind of... No, 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 that's it. I mean, it, 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 I mean, I'm based in London. Nikita is based in Amsterdam, so he's a lot more in tune with what's going on on that degree. I mean, the biggest incentive for the government to even allow coffee shops in the first place is to decrease crime, right? So they don't mm-hmm. want. They, they think it's better to have people go to licensed shops where um, there's an informed person telling you what to buy, and I mean, there's not too much due diligence around the product and those kind of things, but it is definitely safer than going to a street dealer who might also sell you other uh, narcotics. Um, And uh, I think that if you take this away from tourism, it's not like tourists won't still come to Amsterdam if coffee shops are closed. So, I mean, where they're going to try and find their stuff, they're going to go back to the black market, therefore empowering street dealers or certain uh, criminal organizations, which is exactly what the government is trying to get away from. So I, I just don't see this playing out in... Yeah, in real life, uh, it's more just say and uh, say and tell. Yeah, government. I think government is going to lose so much money as well in terms of tax money because that's where a lot of tourists also go. Uh, yeah, just talking about Europe in general, like it looks like a very wild country kind of thing because 
different countries are coming up with their own laws i think germany just started letting on letting in some products and there was this thing from france where they ordered a like they were asking for people companies to send the products for free something like that right yeah, yeah. what do yeah. you guys think of the like european market in general because obviously you are only representing sort of two countries but since you guys started uh, serving the european market for jobs what do you think of europe in general in terms of uh, cannabis so i mean i think for it really broad question particularly i mean if you're looking at the medical side of things for example and one of the mistakes that happened early was where there was a lot of north american money looking at europe as a whole and saying okay the market opportunity is big let's put some resources in it as the population's bigger more people that means there's more money down the line but every single different jurisdiction operates differently and they're all moving at different paces as well um and there's obviously opposing lobbying happening at exactly the same time so to sort of define europe as a blanket as a whole is quite hard there's certainly different markets as you mentioned like germany which is opening up lots more experiments and things coming uh, proposed by governments like france as you mentioned as well where they're sort of saying give us free cannabis and we'll let you trial it on on our people and then we'll yeah. see after x amount of years how effective this is and whether or not it's something we want to continue doing from a commercial perspective whether it makes sense to to do that is is one question but the opportunity to do it is still at least exciting because uh, it shows some traction in the right direction although i have heard people saying that often these experiments are a good way to box in effective lobbying happening too far the other way if you see what i mean so if, for example in the uk some people are of the opinion that all the lobbying happened too quickly and it, we sort of overshot and we forced the regulators to make regulations for cannabis which meant that doctors weren't able to prescribe when it was made legal and there was all sorts of other issues that came around of importing medicines and some people i think are cautious of that and want to make sure that if it's done it's lobbied in the right way and sort of gradually and it's it's thought out properly properly and it's it's safe for all consumers um but i it, it's hard to say because there's always lobbying interest conflated in uh, the actual activities of these governments when they're announcing these uh, tenders for example i mean there's like the 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 Dutch government, one of the things Nikita mentioned is that's quite exciting is, is the recreational tender, which I think is one of the first times in Europe where you can see legal companies operating in recreational cannabis, which means you can invest in recreational cannabis really mm -hmm. for the first time. I find that really exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, it is still an experiment, which means it might not work. Uh, let's hope it does. And I think with the right people involved and hopefully as we're involved in that and we built one of those companies out, uh, we're confident that, that there should be some good results out the back of it. But it's um, it's always it's always hard to tell what the actual sort of intention is necessarily when they were putting the the plan together, whether or not it, it was made to really prove a concept or to, to silence other groups. Um, but ultimately, I'm optimistic. The 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 the, the trend is that most European companies uh, countries are moving towards cannabis in one way or another, whether it's allowing therapeutic CBD in some forms, or allowing medical cannabis experiments to be run, or even medical cannabis to be prescribed to patients in special situations, like in the UK. Uh, but there's obviously a lot of things that go with it. That would be really great to have government support, and that varies between European country in terms of how active the government is in educating doctors, for example, and, and how to prescribe it. Uh, for, uh, the UK is a good example of not very active is the answer there where, you know, the law became, came around and then suddenly there's three, <laughs> three specialist doctors out of the 90,000 odd specialists that were actually able to prescribe it, which meant um, that there wasn't a huge uptake. When you look at Germany, it's a bit different and there's obviously a lot more prescriptions coming through, uh, but I think they all have their, their perks certainly from commercial perspectives and that their pitfalls as well from patient perspectives. So it, I think it's hard to find a balance and I, don't, I wouldn't say anyone's done it perfectly yet, but the, the theme is I'm optimistic for Europe. It's growing slowly and it's growing in different speeds in different places, but it is growing. Mm. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Nick, that, yeah. yeah. I would generally agree with, with Tom uh, on everything that he said. Um, so like, I mean, my, my general opinion of the European market is that in terms of population size, that this is going to be one of the biggest markets in the world. Um, also, I think that we're in a nice position to learn from all of the mistakes that the US and Canada might have made, and even the, those companies coming over to Europe, the mistakes that they made here. So I think that we have quite a nice framework to analyze and learn and um, hopefully do it better the second time round and adapt it to the culture over here. Um, 
it's quite a complex landscape to just like in the US, every state, or in this case, every country is regulating, it's slightly different. So understanding what the regulatory landscape looks like is very different from country to country. And that can be hard to get your head around, um, uh, to get your head around it. But in general, um, I mean, markets like um, the Netherlands doing this recreational experiment, also doing a medical experiment, which we're also part of. Um, so where there's five licenses that have been given out for five companies to cultivate three harvests for the Dutch government to analyze, it needs to be as close as possible to bedroom cans to exist in products for them to actually get a license. Um, we were lucky enough to work with one of those contenders as well and uh, managed to hire a cultivation team for them. And um, so that's moving in the right direction. Like you mentioned, France, uh, the prescriptions in Germany are um, increasing on a daily basis. Uh, same as Italy. Switzerland has a really interesting market when it comes to production um, and the wellness side, CBD, alternative cannabinoid side of things. Um, so I think it's a really interesting market where each each country is kind of finding its groove. Um, and, um, I mean, Portugal, the obvious answer is cultivation. Macedonia, low-cost cultivation. Um, Switzerland, high quality. Um, Germany it, and Italy, like, a, a, but very much a medical market and only a medical market and they're moving uh, um, prescriptions along. Uh, Italy actually has also got the soft cannabis market or CBD flower market, um, which is also interesting. So everything's slowly developing. It's definitely much, uh, it's definitely still a medical market, but I'm really excited to see uh, recreational incentives come into play in the yeah. Netherlands. Um, and um, yeah, I'm very positive for, for this year and the coming future. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think because there's so many different regulations in different jurisdictions that different jurisdictions are emerging as like leaders of certain areas, be it yeah. like lots of extraction companies being built in one place because that's a really good place to build it or uh, distribution businesses or cultivation, as Nikita said, like for low cost reasons, things like that. Um, so it, it and it, again, Italy for CBD flower and, and Switzerland as well, because they can have up to 1% THC, which means that they can play around with the genetics a bit more than than other countries. Uh, so I think it, it gives everyone a chance to sort of define themselves as the leaders of different seg segments of the market. I know each country would encourage their government to be more forthcoming and, and give them sort of a little bit more free reign. But I think gradually as a whole, as each country is is sort of championing in one area and seeing the revenue that can be realized from it. Neighboring countries are also keeping a close eye on that. And I think that's what's moving it forward as a whole, but it, it does mean that there's a staggered approach in levels of experience, but there's a huge amount in certain areas of experience to be unlocked and, and IP as well. Like if you're looking at places like Spain, there's a huge amount of, of genetics and genetic companies there that have been growing for years with genetics that probably have never made it to market. Uh, that I'm sure would be of interest to, to pharmaceutical companies, but then at the same time, the people growing those uh, genetics and breeders as well are exceptionally experienced and some of the most experienced, I'd say potentially in the world, in some cases, Nikita will be able to correct me if I'm wrong on that one, is this really his remit, anything plant touching. Uh, but I'm very excited for when that can, for, for Spain as a country, for example, can really capitalize on that. But for the time being, it's, it's hard for them to do that. And that IP is actually leaking out of their, their country because of a lack of regulation. So there's, there's as we said, there's sort of upsides and downsides to it. Um, and I, I hope that individual countries sort of appreciate their value and their place in it and, and can look after their, their people and IP in relation to each of those more. Yeah, I, I think that's a great thing about Europe is like the transfer or the transportation of goods is quite easier. Mm. Probably because of Brexit now UK is not that great but still i mean that's like uh nikita mentioned like if you have low cost growing somewhere then you can probably transport it much easily and yeah i just recently read i think europe uh, in general i think increased the percentage of thc in hemp which was a great problem in in which was not, which is a great problem right now in india i think one percent is still okay but because of the indian conditions that's what i've heard that you can't grow 0.3 percent thc then you have to get seeds from abroad and then there's cross pollination and all that uh shit happening and most of the growers here in india are outdoor because we have so so many like huge farmlands here so why to invest so much money in you know indoor growing and we have 13 hours 14 hours of sunlight so that's not a problem at all but again the person outdoor what i've heard is outdoor growing usually has high thc 
and especially in india so yeah that's a big problem uh yeah let's talk about you guys i mean how did you guys uh, like your school friends how did you guys started uh, bloom jobs uh, so, like is you, you you guy sure um yeah so we met in in school um like we, yeah we were 11 tom i think right we were 11 i mean I, i grew up in spain where it's allowed to grow five plants per per household um so i had a lot of friends growing up um who started growing and even when i was very young whose parents were growing when i'd go over to their house and i was always quite fascinated um by the plant uh the culture and even little yeah little little parts of of the cannabis industry that i thought were really interesting um that i um that got got consolidated uh, throughout my university uh, years from a recreational side um and also um my explorations into the sustainability side of, of cannabis um led me to actually getting a job at Europe's first medical cannabis clinic in Barcelona where i was responsible for um uh the expansion into the german market what um i also volunteered to do just out of my own interest was to be the translator between uh german i speak three languages spanish german and english so i was the translator uh, to the spanish doctors in the clinic when english or german patients came in for me this was a way to understand how they perceived these kind of medicines how these medicines were prescribed to them how they dosed these medicines and how it improved the quality of life of these patients coming from so many different backgrounds and different conditions that they were treated with this um that again became much more real when my mother unfortunately got breast cancer she went through really intense chemotherapy and from what i learned at that clinic um and we had a lot of patients with different sorts of cancer coming through the door i um introduced my mother to the clinic and also um guided her through her kind of um uh, through a treatment with with different cannabinoids um and that worked wonders really i mean the doctors in germany said they hadn't seen such a swift recovery in a long time um that kind of was the last straw for me and i decided i would like to dedicate my career to this as it was a passion of mine it's helping people and it just hit a hit a um, emotional spot for me at that point as well um when um I I then started consulting um various companies um and doing project management and just kind of offering my my uh, services to as many cannabis companies as I could in order to understand the landscape under um understand patients even more and um understand how these markets were developing. Um Tom then funnily enough called me um right after I mean Tom do you want me to start it like that or do you want to do like Yeah yeah come on. So um yeah Tom then called me um uh saying that he is looking to leave his job at financial services and uh, wants to jump into cannabis um he had already uh, gone out and met i think everyone in the industry at that point which was like 12 people and um managed to get like three jobs <laughs> within a day so uh we were a bit like okay this is this is interesting and we just started developing how, or like looking at how the the market in England um was developing he then also pulled me into a company that he was working for grow biotech at the time where i was a consultant on raw materials and other things did some project management for them as well and slowly but surely uh tom identified that there was a um definite need for hr services i mean there was this kind of typical theme that everyone would ask us to bring our friends and to introduce like young passionate educated people um so we thought or tom actually said this this would be a, a great opportunity to start a recruitment arm for this industry um that was definitely in line with my experiences of the industry and the research also confirmed that a little bit more and we decided to put our heads together and figure out how we can bring um a professional approach to hiring people in this industry uh, as we just identified multiple flaws or weird approaches to hiring in this industry uh, which we um tried to solve with our process and um, understanding of the landscape um tom over to you <laughs> yeah yeah i think that yeah that, i think that summarizes it really nicely and and similar to nikita i think <clears throat> i sort of i got really bound to it from an emotional perspective for personal reasons in the in the family as well i think a lot of people come to the industry and because they've explored it from 
looking after family members and things like that or trying to explore other options and, and that was no different for me um but then obviously have, making it a job i've had to work as well so we had to find a commercial commercially viable plan that would allow us to 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 help this industry grow and and like it literally just makes the most sense if we're going to help an industry grow then it's growing by people so let's find the best people to help it grow so it, it felt really logical a lot of people when I was leaving my job in financial services, like this is a huge risk. What are you doing? And it kind of felt like as much risk as waiting early at a train station for the train to arrive sort of thing. Like we knew that the train was coming. It's just a case of um, making sure we're there. Like, yes, the train could always crash or something could go backward, but it's unlikely at the rate that it was moving. And we saw, you know, the US opening up, Canada opening up, lots of discussion starting to happen in Europe, m and activity happening. It felt very inevitable. It was just a case of the only risk is we need to do it right. That was it. So our, our core focus was how can we add the most value to the industry? And I guess that's where we we built the team strategically to, to make sure that was always in mind. So we brought in um, ex-colleagues of mine from financial services. He's a good friend and a mentor. Um, as a non-exec director called Harry Giuliani, uh, who, who's is very well-versed in building successful startups and, and making businesses work and do what they're supposed to do, uh, which has been really, really useful for us. And then Ellen as well, who's an absolute core member of the, of the founding team, who's a friend of mine. She, she's from life science recruitment. So she was working with similar positions in pharma. Um, and it was a case of adapting her experience and her process to fit the cannabis industry and, and what we've seen. And that's been taking place over the course of three years. It's always a a moving beast as the industry is constantly changing. Apologies for a car driving outside, uh, a truck driving outside even. I'll just beat myself. No, 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 um, it's fine, it's fine, yeah. It's okay, okay. Um, so so we, we, we wanted to fill all, all the gaps as quick as possible. So we wanted the specific recruitment experience, particularly around life sciences. We saw sort of the pharma clinical side of the cannabis industry, obviously having the most initial growth. And from a personal perspective, we all felt like that's the most important piece as well in terms of getting patient access and everything sorted first. Um, and then when it comes to the, the, the corporate side and the strategic high level, that's where Harry comes in really helpful as well. Um, and I, I feel that sort of completed us as a, as a business. And so since then, it's been a case of um, just observing the industry, looking at like, take, approaching it very cautiously. We've seen, I think, a lot of people rushing in and I'm sure you've seen as well, people trying to sort of get rich quick. Yeah. A lot yeah. of cowboys, a lot of people setting up businesses, which may not have the best intentions in mind, or sometimes even, you know, they may have really good intentions, uh, but they've rushed it and they haven't taken proper caution. So I think we've really helped, it really helped us shape our due diligence effectively. Uh, we, we approach it like we're an investment company. If we're going to work with a business, it's would I put money in that business? Because I, I will be putting candidates in that business. And if there's a problem in six months, then I'm going to be hearing about it either way. So I, I think we approach it quite Similarly, which is hard in an early market where there's a lot of people getting involved for the right and the wrong reasons. But I think it's it's allowed us to build a process that is now sifted through that, if you like, and, and then a, a reputation and a, and a network in the space, which means that we can really actually help people, um, which I, yeah. So in, in regards to what we set out to do, we're, we're sort of doing it, which is really a, a nice thing to be able to say. Yeah. It, it didn't come easy. I really didn't like, especially with things like the pandemic last year, yeah. you know, it, it's exceptionally tough on the industry. The, the, the European market was not in it for the cannabis industry and other industries was not necessarily in a good place last year with or without COVID. So COVID really accelerated the demise of, of certain companies that maybe shouldn't have been around and took it from a sort of 18th month limping along to a six month, these businesses are, are packed up and finished, which is sort of like, if you see the, the dot-com bubble bursting on the other side of that, all of the professionals and the sort of the jockeys, not the horses, if you like, the, the best jockeys got together to form the Amazons and the Google. And that's sort of what we're seeing now, but it feels really good to be instrumental in that. Um, and, and to be able to say, like, we, we know who was the champion in this company because we spent a lot of time working with them. Um, but it, it's, the, it's this perspective, sort of the, the peak under the bonnet perspective, which may be something that we didn't necessarily anticipate, um, but it, it certainly helped us make sense of the industry as well. And, and by that, I mean, um, you know, there's a lot of PR in the industry in general saying we're good, we did this, we've done that. And a lot of it's, it's fake um, and it's not necessarily its whole truths. Uh, but we can often see past that because, you know, 
if it's fake, the team will call us and say, we want to quit and move jobs and go somewhere else. And it really helps us understand who's actually who in the industry and therefore which businesses we actually want to support that we believe are doing the right thing and, and pushing us towards a sort of a net positive industry where like it, it's really our core values that we believe this industry is has the ability to have a, a massive positive effects on so many different corners of society from sustainability, patient access, things like reducing organized crime. Uh, but it's always sort of a, a, a step, one punch at a time to get there. But I think as long as we've kept that in mind, we've, um, we can sleep very easily at night, if you know what I mean. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, as our mission is to bring value to this industry through HR, it's um, the, the only way that we can kind of measure our success is through the success of our clients off the back of working with us. So um, for us, it's very important to understand who we're working with. We spend most of our time qualifying clients and seeing whether this is the right uh, uh, company for our um, candidates and also for, for if it's good for the, for the industry. Um, so yeah, there's quite a stringent due diligence process before uh, we can do what we set out to do.